guys want to play with us on the next song fine if you want to go sit back down you can this is not a kid's song but it's a fun song to play chaos Hey! 
So, Terry, um, yeah. something big's happening for you this week. Um, <laughs> Terry injured himself in uh, doing, doing a good deed for somebody else. And yeah. uh, as a result of that, uh, you're having shoulder, shoulder surgery. What did you actually do to you without, I mean, he can explain it to you, but maybe the, the layman's The layman's term, yeah. Well, I was up on a ladder putting some pergola up, and uh, the ladder decided to take a left turn when I was going straight. And uh, my foot caught in the ladder and ripped me off the lot, ripped me off the off the pergola, and I landed on my back and my right shoulder. And the bottom line is it took one of the tendons, the one that goes over the top, and literally ripped it off the bone. So um, Wednesday, the doctor needs to go in, and they actually are going to put stitches and sew the tendon back onto the bone, and then it has to heal. And uh, they say it's probably one of the most painful surgeries that you can have. Are you so serious? We'll find it. Yeah, that's what they tell me. We'll, we'll see. I, I know for the last... We can, we can look forward to seeing you a little tripped out, huh? Yeah. The other day I was hurting a lot. I wonder what I, he's I, like when he's in, that I, I was, well, I was at work the other day, and I was hurting a lot, so I finally took some drugs, and I walked out to the secretary, and I said, uh, in about an hour you're going to see me on drugs. And I walked out later, and they were laughing at me, uh. you know. Uh, I guess I don't get too weird. I don't know. I, oh, I don't got feel great, like I am. Uh, you got a great personality. I would hate so, to tamper with that, you so. know, mind-altering things. So, but, Terry, this is, this is going to be a game changer because uh, you won't be at work for a while. I'll be off about three months. About three months. Um, and, um, and what's going to happen with your strumming? You know, He's not gonna be able I to don't strum. know. Honestly, I know there's some severe limitations as far as the arm um, – if it's down to my side, I'm okay, but start going out, that's a no-no for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then eventually, with PT, up to three, three months, they say it could take as much as nine months to get the full back of everything. So does that mean you're gonna, I'm, the band's dependent on me for rhythm? Yep. Boy. <laughs> I may be up. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, we have some hecklers in the crowd. Yeah, All we, right. we sure do. So um, it, it'll be it'll be interesting. Uh, Irving Street's not going to play again for another month, so hopefully by that time, I guess we'll I'll just have to settle for your voice only. Huh? Possibly, yeah. Okay. We'll see. Anyway, our prayers are with Terry. Uh, he's got a really excellent surgeon working on him. And, yeah. Uh, we'll we'll be we'll be your prayer partners. Well, I do appreciate that. Okay. So while you can still uh, strum a little bit, let's. Um, okay.
church. What would we do without those important affirmations? This is a running joke. Uh, City Sanctuary is a wonderful place to be. We're not really big on applause and things like that. And, uh, and unfortunately, we, don't, we, have, we seem to have trouble moving our bodies around, Don, except for you. But uh, we do love great music, and that's a beautiful song. My only hope is in you. Uh, we have another gentleman in our church that's having surgery on Thursday. It's Kurt. Brother, we're with you. Uh, Kurt had a, a situation happen uh, where his eye began to take a right-hand turn. And he's having a major surgery to pull that muscle back in on Thursday. And, um, and the doctor might even work on that right eye to pull them together because uh, if you talk to him, you have to concentrate on which eye to look at. <laughs> And uh, that's not the way it used to be for him. So Thursday is a very big, and this is a, a very complicated type of surgery. So Thursday, mo Thursday morning, you said? So let's pray for Kurt. Can we do that also and uh, make that a priority? So our dear, dear friend Matthew is leaving us for now. Matthew's on the front row. He has endeared himself to many of us. Um, He's leaving us for Hollywood, and uh, I guess if you're going to be left for something, you know, it might as well be that. I hear they have an Adventist church in Hollywood. Okay. You will actually live outside of Hollywood. Okay. Didn't feel right to you. So Hollywood didn't feel right. You're going to live outside of that. And, but the Hollywood Adventist Church there is, is a good church, a good place for you to be. Okay. All right. So will you come back to us someday, maybe? Oh, participate. What you need. Well, we're so happy that you, you chose us uh, not that long ago, and, and keep us with you. We'd like to be a part of your life. So Amen. praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. So today I want to start a new series. It's called The Mind of Christ. Uh, yeah, what, Don? Pastor Colby? Okay. Oh, he's Canadian. Colby, uh, happy Thanksgiving, Pastor Colby. I'm sorry I overlooked that. How insensitive of me. <laughs> and I guess we should, that goes to Aaron also and, and, and all of our dear Canadian pals. Okay. Wow. Thank you, Don. Now I lost my train of thought, but, and, and you're leaving. So there, yeah, that's great. All right. Hit and run, hit and run. Uh, so uh, when we had the election for our president, uh, presidential election 2016, um, I made a decision that I was going to speak about it at, in the pulpit. And I did a, a series on, on what, I, what I think, uh, what would be a good way for us to journey through that as a church. I don't know if you remember that. You have to dig those out. Uh, because we were seeing something uh, during the election uh, starting with the Republican, uh, um, um, what do they call them? Yeah, the, the Republican debates. I'm sorry, thank you. And then, of course, it went into the election, and, of course, election night was, was such a shock to our country, and, and we've been in a, a, kind of in a place of shock ever since, as it were. And um, when I preached uh, about that, I was going against uh, my Adventist training and my Adventist heritage in that you never talked about politics uh, 
in the pulpit. And we are a church that believes in separation of church and state, and for good reason. And actually, uh, a Seventh-day Adventist is, is at odds with many of the other Christian walks who believe in using the political process and joining with the political process and influencing the political process in a way to even legislate morality. We have chosen, uh, and this is from our pioneers, that, that uh, the, the, the events of the state and our journey as a, as a spiritual community, as a religious community, should be remained separate. And so you have not seen Adventists in our history involved in that political process. Well, then, of course, Ben Carson ran uh, for that, and, and, of course, that was interesting, too. The dynamic is, though, because we never talk about it, it doesn't mean that it's not impacting the church. Do you agree? Now, most of the churches I've pastored have all been pretty much straight-ahead Republican. That's, just, um, that's what Adventists tend to be. Uh, East Coast, West Coast, at least the churches I was in. And, uh, and definitely out at Hoodview when I was pastoring there. When we came down here, there was a significant change. And we began to notice it pretty early is that there was a wide divergence of thought. Now, in the back of my mind, I said, when we go downtown Portland, uh, I'm expecting things to be different. I didn't really fully realize that on so many levels, it was different. It's a good thing we came down here with not a stuck-up attitude like we knew what we were going to do, because we would have never been able to learn and have some sensitivities to the reality of those who live in Portland. Portland is not a Republican town, right? And I found out that within our church, we had a wide spectrum of political thought. I wanted our church to be able to be a place where that could be talked about if people chose to. And so we started over the years to have these little chats, but it really heated up a few years ago with the, with the election and people's thoughts and opinions and beliefs and and uh, it was a fascinating part to be, to be a part of a church that was able to converse with divergent views and still be okay with each other. That was an unusual uh, moment. And it told me something about us, that by God's grace, we understand what's the most important thing, and that is unity in Jesus. And that our politics and our belief and uh, the way that we go about expressing our concern, can be as different as night and day. But it's Jesus and his cross and his sacrifice that rules supreme in this church. And that supersedes all of that. Well, here we are now, three years down the road. And uh, I've decided to get back into the pol political dynamic because when I was thinking about a new series, this this is the only thing that would come to my mind. It was it. This three years of something we've never experienced before. Would you agree? In your lifetime, have you seen a three years like this in American government? No. It just has not happened. Um, it, people say, well, it's always been happening. It was just underground. Maybe, maybe not. I don't think so. This is, we're in a time now that we haven't seen before. So do, does the church address that or do we just pretend it's not happening? And I think we should address it. I think we should talk about it. But I think it needs to be from a perspective of how to travel in it and through it while it's happening. Are you with me on that? Um, many people will post on Facebook, even our members, a very differences of opinions, and as you start to see the candidates come forward for the election, there's going to be more and more of this. But it's, 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 it's not just that, you guys. It's, I don't remember a day not looking at my phone and seeing some kind of chaos because of President Trump. There I said his name in church, God forgive me. The, the truth is, we that's become our norm. That's our new normal. Three years of a normal where there's just chaos. 
And everything is personal, it seems to him. And so because he does Twitter, and he bypassed the old traditions of press conferences, he has a direct Twitter feed to where? The world. So he's giving us what he wants to give us instantaneously, second to second. What has happened over time is, who's in control then? The man is doing the talking to everybody. He controls it by how? Well, first of all, his position helps, but it's a constant statement every day, day in and day out. He's the most talked about president we have ever had. He's created the most conflict and divergence of opinion than we've ever had. And he feeds it every day by telling us things about his thought process. Every day. Several times a day. And the kinds of things that he's sharing are these deep and profound things. Are they words of encouragement and unity? No, he's responding to some kind of personal attacks that have come his way or criticisms. And it can be on any level of society. Our president, if somehow the press gets out and you get some kind of viral connection, he would say, hey, Kurt, uh, who are you? You know, who are you? And, and so we, we've never had someone address the people of society like our president. What happens is that it's become invasive. Now, we're not talking about politics here. We're talking about the way things are. I didn't use my phone for a week. I didn't look at the news for a week. And Burton, you and I have done this before, taking timeouts from our news. When I turned it back on, man, there was a whole new batch of things. <laughs> I'd missed a whole week of Twitter. <laughs> And all the chaos that came out of every single episode. Well, now we have a, an impeachment probe, correct? And so that's in play. Well, we've seen that before. We saw it with Nixon. We've seen it with Clinton. Uh, but this one has begun. Um, the impeachment probe is going gonna, is gonna to work its way through somehow. It's going to happen. Okay. Uh, we pull our troops uh, we pull our troops back with Syria, from Syria. The Turkish army comes in. And you start to see that... I, I really don't know what's going on, do you? I mean, who, who's, who's really in control here? Um, I, I don't see a sense of order in the world. You know, the proprieties... Uh, the way things should be done, could be done, the best way to have relationships. All those things are completely fragmented now. It's taken about three years, but everything's pretty much on edge, everywhere, on every level. Okay? Am I right or wrong? Even if you are supportive of our president, you cannot deny the fact that he's made a huge mess. And he doesn't, hasn't just made it, he continues to what? Continues to make it. Because our president is convinced that the world is better because of him. And the world is about him. Okay? The fact that conservative Christians support him only adds to the irony. The problem is... Uh, our church is uh, in Portland. Portland is not a, a Trump town. As uh, things start to heat up, there's going to be more. I just feel a wave is coming. I feel something's coming. Um, I, th I was looking at all the subpoenas of, the, of these main officers who are being called before Congress, and they're not going. 
<laughs> and so you're really seeing for the first time who really has the power. Who can make so-and-so do what? Okay? As we watch this happen, wherever you are politically, there has to be a way that God can help us travel in it. Okay? It has to be something that allows us to take in what's happening in our world because it affects everyone profoundly. But there has to be a way that we can understand as much as we can, but we travel with the kind of focus that allows people to see there's all this stuff going on, but you know what? They seem to know where they are what? Going. Because a lot of people don't know where they're going right now. And for those who have depended on our government to give them a sense of security, that's gone now. The best thing we can offer that somehow in Jesus, we know where we're going in the middle of all of this. It's a time for us to shine, as it were. Not to retreat, not to hide from talking about things, but to step forward and say, hey, there's a way for us to go through this. Instead of having to try to depend, defend this or that, you know. Um, I've um, taken my name out of both parties, all, any party. I'm a dis, oh, what do you call it? I'm not an independent. I used to be an independent. That's what I was. Yeah, I'm, I'm a partyless voter, okay? Um, just because that, it was my way of saying I've given up on this process. It just, it's broken. It's shattered. It is. It's just the way it is. So now I've spent quite a few minutes on, on this. And this is supposed to be a sermon, right? But the truth is, I don't have a lot of experience talking about this in the pulpit. Because I was not supposed to, and I'm still not supposed to really talk about it. But I found a text. I found two texts. Two texts that we need. And I'd like to do a little mini-series on the mind of Christ. Because if we get a sense of what his, his mind is about then we have a way to travel through. So turn to, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verse 1, I urge you then, brothers, because of these mercies from God to present your body as what? Living, holy, pleasing sacrifices to God, which is the reasonable way to serve Him in worship. Don't be conformed to the way of our what? Our world. My Bible says modern age. Don't be what? Conformed to what? The world. We are not to be in a mode of conformity, which is interesting because I won't get into that. That's a, that's a sideshow. Conformity is not what we are supposed to be with the world. We are not to conform to the world's way of thinking. But we're supposed to be transformed by the renewal of what? Of our minds. Don't conform to the world, but your mind needs to be transformed and what? Renewed. So that you can be able to determine what is God's good and pleasing and perfect will is. So what does that mean to you? Just quickly. Basically what? The way the world thinks. The way the world thinks. We are not to what? Conform to it. We are instead to be transformed by the renewing of what? So our mind is supposed to be different from the world's mind. Now, to me, that's critical. 
That is so critical in a chaotic world like this. There's all this people trying to understand what the heck is going on. All along said, listen, this, this way of thinking, don't conform to it. Don't be locked into it. You need to be transformed and have your what? Mind renewed. Oh boy. If our minds are renewed, we are not going to be identifying so much with any political processes. Because our political process, is that from God? Be careful. Careful. Be very careful. Our government was formed by deists who believed in God. But it's really about man determining his destiny. Okay? It's a self-determination concept that's at the core of America. Okay? One of the things... Okay, forget about it. I'm not... Okay. <laughs> this is going to be difficult. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 because this is the main text for this series. Um, we're, we're told to... Um, to have a transformation of our mind and not to think and conform to what kind of mind? The world's mind. Okay? It's, how do you do that? How do you do that? Live in the world and not be conformed to its way of thinking. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. By the way, I, I love preaching sermons like this because you know what? They could just blow up right in my face. Right? It could just blow up. I mean, every, every second I could blow this up, Colby. Just because um, you, you just never know. It is such a sensitive area. I have known so many marriages that will not talk about what? Politics. Best friends will not talk about what? Don't, you don't do it. But we, we can do it here, right? Unless we're conforming to the world's way of thinking, then we really can't do that. But if we're getting a new kind of a mind, we should be able to do what? Talk about it. If Edna says so, that's what I believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to skip down to the actual core text. We'll be coming back and looking at it as we run into it. But in verse 10, let's go ahead. Um, to us, God has, has been revealed by who? The Spirit. The Spirit searches what? All things. Even the deepest thoughts of who? All right. Spirit does what? Searches all things, even what? The deep thoughts of who? So the, the idea of the Holy Spirit alive in your heart, what's the significance of that then? Well, if he searches the deepest thoughts of God and he's active in your life, that's quite a connection. Okay? And then it says here, who knows the thoughts of a person except the spirit of the person in him? So too, no one knows God's thoughts except who? The Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, okay? And now we get down here. It says, now we have not received the world spirit, but the spirit who is from God. So there's a spirit in the world, and then there's a spirit from God. Two spirits. There seems to be a way of thinking, a world thinking, and then there's a God's way of thinking. You see, there's this, this contrast. Um. Spirit from God, so that we may know that which God has freely given to us. Verse 13, and it is these things about which we speak, not in the words taught by human wisdom, but in those that are taught by the Spirit, okay? Different kind of teaching, different kind of education, combining spiritual teaching with spiritual words. And then it says here in verse 14, but the natural man, the natural person does not welcome the teachings of what? God's Spirit. The natural man, which is, what is the natural man? 
Well, that's you and me without what? Without God's Spirit, without accepting Christ. We, we, are, we are that person. We're very capable of being that person, and we all know that. But a natural person does not welcome the teachings of God's Spirit because they are foolishness to him. Okay. If you have the thinking of the world and you've conformed to it, everything about God might want to be teaching you through his Spirit, it comes across as what? Foolish. So that would mean, typically, that, that the people we interact with in this city, they're going to hear this uh, spirit-driven concept about traveling through life, and they're going to say, man, that's really what? Yeah, that's really foolish. That's really foolish. That's, a, that's this and that. Okay? Okay. And he isn't able to know them, about them, because they have to be investigated spiritually. See, it's not foolish if you spiritually are investigating. All of a sudden, the light goes on. Things begin to connect. But verse 15, but the spiritual person is able to investigate everything, while on the other hand, no one has the ability to investigate him. Who has known the Lord's mind? Who will instruct him? And there's our punchline. What does it say? But we have the mind of what? Christ. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, when the Bible in Romans talks about transfer, a, a, a transformation of your mind, it's a transformation from what? The natural man's mind to the mind of Somebody. Whose mind? This series about is about, so what is the mind of Christ? Is that worthy of, of our exp exploration? What is the mind of Christ? Because if we can discover some of that, that's the way to travel. That's our way. We take, instead of conforming to the world's way of thinking and the entire process that we live in right now and the chaos that it's in, we are to have a transform by the renewing of our mind. And we're told that through the Spirit, we are taught and we begin to have the mind of who? Christ. The question is, what is the mind of Christ? If we can come up with some answers for that, some concrete, clear answers for that, that's the way we travel, man. That's the way we roll. So let's just let that unfold for us, and then we can say, you know, can I find that in my political party? Can I find that in a candidate? Can I find it in their platform? Yes or no? It'll be clear. And I think what you're going to find, I think what we will find is a separate path altogether. A separate focus, a separate way to do life in the modern world here in our country. So as the impeachment investigation goes on, and as wars start and finish and troops are pulled out, and while all this drama is going on for three years and more drama to come, and, and how everything seems to be so incredibly personal for everybody. And we're seeing unparalleled anger and hate and anxiety. The world is anxious now. Everybody's on pins and needles. They don't know what's going to happen. And as our market goes up and down, there is a way. It says, but it needs to be not the natural man's brain. It has to be the mind of who? It has to be the mind of Christ. So what is that? And so that will be our, our new series. And uh, I'll be interested to hear from you what you guys think the mind of Christ is. Um, if we try to break it down into something very real, uh, we might be really surprised how brilliant it really is and how we can cope better with what's going on. Let's pray.
Lord, as the band comes back up, um, so we're, we're just going to jump in here. We want to discover your mind. And um, I think if we explore that, uh, we can get really clear about the best way for us to travel. Um, and so I pray that this will be a fruitful journey, a journey where we can, as a church, Lord, you know, just talk out loud about what's happening and the best way, Lord, for your spirit to educate us so that our minds don't conform to the world, but that we take on the mind of Christ. What a wonderful trade-off. In Jesus' name, amen. Terry, I noticed that we have some um, some fast strumming songs here. So, in honor of you, and uh, <laughs> we can do it again. Let's kick it. Okay. Well, I've been held by the Savior.
City Sanctuary. Those who listen online, have a great day. We'll see you next Sabbath.